The industrial neighborhood of East Williamsburg has a secret. During the day, one can only see warehouses and freight yards. But at night, something changes. It becomes a hotbed of the underground music scene. So I feel like the DIY scene really bloomed out of a rejection of everything that Manhattan represented. The kind of just nasty business-like attitude of all of it, where you've got club owners that are just trying to basically scam everyone out of their money. DIY started much more as a community thing. The obscure locations of these DIY venues may not be so much out of choice as necessity. Alcohol licenses are really expensive, you know, like $10,000 or something minimum. And so when you're starting a DIY club, if you and your buddies are like, yeah, let's start a venue, you don't have $10,000 just to throw down. And if the cops show up, and there's an unlicensed bar serving minors, like you're done. You don't want to draw too much attention to yourself. You want people to come out and you want people to get there so you want it to be not completely isolated, but you don't have the resources to put it right in the middle of like a big you know, area like Bedford Ave or the East Village or any of these areas. On a Friday night in early spring, I filmed Heaney's performance at the warehouse venue called Aviv. Unfortunately, the concert was too loud for my microphone. The actual audio itself is really compressed, so everything's already kind of gelled together. This is just straight compression. Russo has set up a miniature recording studio in his room and did his best to fix the recording. But in the end, it proved a difficult task. At a venue like this, there's no mix on anything. It's just amps on stage, blasting away at super high volumes, and then the PA is just there to really crank the shit out of the vocals um, to try and get them above all the other noise. And on top of that, we're in a, basically a giant garage, so. Do you know where, uh, can you tell me where Aviv is? Yeah, it's actually this white door. Right over there is where you're going to enter. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, are you guys looking for a beat It's like white door. Yep. Fine going. Um, yeah. I'm filming for the band Heaney. Is that all right? Can oh, I bring in a camera? Yeah, that's cool. Um, just talk to Olivia when you go in. There's someone taking pictures for um, Impose tonight, but that's all about right. it. So. Thank you very much. Cool. No problem. <laughs> I 
think it's great. Check. She makes friends with everyone. Softest eyes and sharpest tongue. She makes friends with everyone. But she goes home. The music is sort of like the unconscious thing that just like, just drives my like emotional response and my like energy on stage. Like that just fills me up. I don't even know how. And that's why oftentimes I like play way too loud or like I get to the end of the show and my hands like they're finally wearing off now, but I'll have, I'll be covered in blisters because I have so much adrenaline from the music and from the crowd. Now, when I think of DIY, I really think of a band just sitting there with like a cassette recorder, blistering stuff all over the place and hitting the pavement hard, so to speak. I mean, that was Heaney, definitely. The only stuff they had online was just a picture of Mark and Max butt naked on stage at Much More's, which is hilarious. Mark Fletcher, our guitar player, met Max Kagan, who's our lead singer and guitar player, main songwriter. And when those two met, that's kind of what formed Heaney. They just clicked right away, and they were both actually on Ecstasy, too, so maybe that helped their, like, getting to know each other. Heaney is very much kind of like a family band, in a sense. It's just, uh, you know, the scene it is is there and they're very much part of the scene and the scene's kind of like one giant family. Usually I think the DIY venues tend to be more energetic and the fans are more into it. Oftentimes we have more fans there that know our music. We played Webster Hall the other day. It was just like the crowd was like motionless. They just like didn't move. It is difficult to describe the atmosphere at an underground concert. There is a relentlessness among the crowd. We just have a couple more left. Thank you so much to the Noats and to the Greenians. 
Even when they are tired, hungry, and dehydrated, they stay and maintain the energy long into the night. Happy birthday! New York is full of these scenes, these little independent scenes. And some of them are so far from my experience, I have no idea what's going on in them. And what we all have in common is that we are trying to do something as free people in New York City. It starts with wanting to do something and not being allowed to do something for some reason. The established corporations, venues, art studios don't allow you to do that or aren't responding to you. Do you have agency and control over what it is that you're creating? Or is there another party that's sort of defining the parameters for what that is? It can be difficult to maintain artistic integrity in a society which values the dollar above all else. If a venue becomes large enough, companies like Vice may offer money to sponsor shows, but bring with them an unwanted legitimacy. Once you introduce bouncers and licensing, uh, the atmosphere changes. Without corporate support, it can be a struggle for art venues to stay afloat. One such space, Panoply Performance Laboratory on Meserol Street, has managed to stay open without sponsorship for over 10 years. On the night I visited the lab, artist Tiff Robinette performed her piece called Material Labor. I arrived in the afternoon as Tiff was setting up and asked her about her work. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're setting up right now? Well, my work tends to come out of my everyday, and my everyday for a while now has been just physically working all the time. I'm interested in the way our specific personal ancestors worked and the way we work now. Mm -hmm. Most people are doing immaterial labor now. They go to an office and they work on the computer 40 hours a week and there's nothing physical to show for it at the end. Whereas we used to live in a culture where we made stuff. Panoply has been an artist studio since the 90s, but the building itself used to be a carriage house. My interview is cut short by a disturbance in the back room. When I returned, it was night, and Tiff's performance was in full swing. The rules of the game were simple and nonsensical. Volunteers from the audience tried to either pump all of the water levels as evenly as possible, or as unevenly as possible. One other person was enlisted to shred paper, and every five minutes when the timer went off, to light a smoke bomb. I couldn't resist the opportunity to get in on the action, so I donned the anonymizing suit and assumed the position of paper shredder. I became immersed in the rhythm of the labor. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. 
So we got rules, so we can use the rules to our advantage. Can we ask for those? Get rid of all the water? Yeah. Right. Stop it. As per usual at DIY events, beer was cheap, and soon everyone began to feel the effects and break the rules. The room was filled with smoke, but just like at Aviv, the participants did not stop until the event officially ended. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Thank you all so much. After five hours of specific pumping, the participants relaxed and socialized. So unusual was this scene to me that as I emerged into the outside world, it felt as though I were waking from a dream. The only thing that's going through my head is like, holy shit, holy shit, what the fuck? We just have a couple more left. Thank you so much to the Noats and to the Greenians and to the Electrolytes. Uh, yeah. I am Daniel McClanfeld. I perform as VJ Fuzzy Bastard. Uh, that's VJ, not DJ, <laughs> even though everyone gets confused. Uh, and the group is the Azerbaijan AV Club. We do improvised music and video, all performed and created live. And we are very conscious of video being an instrument in the band. Because it's improvised and spontaneous and experimental, uh, I call it jazz. Yet another group of independent Brooklyn artists is the electronic media scene. Like many of these projects, the Azerbaijan AV Club practices and often performs in basements. We definitely pass the playing in a grungy basement test, and we have a lot of cables, which are sort of strewn all over the stage, so we're definitely a DIY look. McKleinfeld's group is part of a growing community of video artists who perform in whatever spaces they can find. At Culture Hub, a relatively high-tech Manhattan venue, a group of artists led by Eric Barry Drayson project intricate visualizations all around the room, each manipulating a shared signal. But the venue, with its state-of-the-art technology, calls into question whether this performance is really DIY. Drayson says labels aren't important. 
fundamentally we're doing this without any corporate support. There's no money behind this. We don't make any money doing this. We do this because we want to, you know? And as far as I'm concerned, that's what makes this DIY. To define DIY by its aesthetic properties is to discredit the artwork itself. But there is no doubt that this subculture has its own look and feel. A lot of DIY stuff is about exposing the joints, letting the audience see the process without a lot of obsessing over a slick surface. A lot of us at once really want slightly better conditions, but would be uncomfortable if we were suddenly dropped into a Broadway theater and would immediately set about to find ways to expose all the joists in the building. No matter how you define the current DIY climate, the past indicates today's independent artwork may be part of tomorrow's mainstream culture. In history, there have been lots of DIY movements. You know, the whole history of the avant-garde was DIY. You know, they were doing things without institutional support. And then within 10, 15 years, they become adopted by the institutions. It's always been sort of this cycle. Right now, I feel like this scene is growing. Uh, at least the particular corner of it that I know. I've been in New York long enough to know that eventually it will die. The scene grows, it grows, it gets more interesting, more artists come in, and then at some point, the money disappears, the economy changes, a new generation of people moves to the city, you know, and then that scene dies. And then something else comes along. And something else will come along when the scene is dead, because thank God that's what happens. Two times.